Yes, so my name is Susie. I work at the Institute of Marine Research in Bergen, in Norway. Uh, this is a marine research institute, so they deal with fishing photos, uh, but also aquaculture is quite a big activity. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about basic salmon lice biology. I'll talk a little bit about uh, new research that's done on uh, especially behavior of salmon lice. And then in the end, I'll also get into a little discussion on management of this parasite. As you, I think most of you know here, uh, salmon lice is a parasite of salmon and fish. So that is Atlantic salmon, trout, and Arctic chow. Fish that I found both in Norway where I work, but also in the Nice Islands. Uh, what I wanted to say was that stress is this is a parasite that is naturally occurring. It's part of the natural ecosystem. But it's adapted to feed on a fish that has fairly low host densities. So for the Atlantic salmon, really they don't hang around a lot along the coast. Sea trout is quite different, they uh, have a much more coastal location. Um, but the problem with salmon lice is that they are adapted to this type of fish, and suddenly we have so large biomasses of this fish available for them to parasitize. And that's why we have the problem. And salmon lice has been and is still a problem in all salmon farming areas uh, here in the north. Atlantic, it's a salmon louse, uh, in the Pacific you have other species, but it's pretty much the same problem. I also wanted to touch upon that, yes, we're talking about salmon louse primarily, but we also have a different species called Caligus elongatus. I don't think there's any good common name. In Norway we call it the Scottish louse. But um, if you look at the picture to the left, you see uh, on the left there's the, the salmon louse, the female, which is very large and has been eating quite a lot. You see on the left then there's a male, and then we have a female and a male, Caligus elongatus. They look very similar, it's only really in the adult stage that it's easy to see the difference. Uh, they sit on the surface of the fish and choose on the skin, uh, but they have sort of different strategies. Um, whereas Salmon lice only like salmon eat fish, so the three species really. Uh, Caligus will go on any type of fish. I think there are more than 100 species described as a host. Um, they um, have a different, they have a much less close relationship to the fish, so it's not unusual for them to change host, whereas salmon lice mainly stays on the fish that infest. Once it's on the fish, it will pretty much stay there. Uh, the Caligus also, is, since it's not a specialist, uh, it's not so well adapted to salmon. And the salmon, we see that the fish is quite affected. Uh, you see that they are really annoying. They probably itch much more than the salmon now. So we get uh, different behavior in the fish when they have been infected. And um, in Norway, it's mainly been a problem in, in the northern parts. But we see that we have the species all along. Uh, with that, I mean, I don't know exactly what the situation in Iceland is. I'm just saying that we have two species, and it might not be so easy to predict which one will cause the most problems. Uh, the problem with Caligus is also that you see this quite different pattern where farmers report that one day there are none, and the next there are lots of them which is probably due to that the calibers are sometimes brought in as adults on wild fish and the wild fish swims past the farm and they jump. And suddenly your site is full of them. To the right of this is the picture of what it looks like. This is mainly Caligus elongatus. This is a cod. So they like cod. They, this cod actually also has some cod lights. We can't see the details, but sometimes you get these quite heavy infections. Yes, okay, so going a little bit backwards, salmon lice life cycle. Now, Tondur has already said a lot of the things, so I'll just say very quickly, when we say H stages, do you actually know what, why we call it H stages? Uh, sea lice have an exoskeleton, so they have an outer shell. If they want to grow and develop, they need to exchange it. And that's what defines the stages. 
So every time they go into a new stage, they have to go through this mold where they shed this exoskeleton. We have three lava stages, the nopis and the coated, but the last one is the one that can infect. So I just have to say as a biologist, there's no self-infection. I know what you mean when you say self-infection, but for self-infection to me, it's that one fish infects itself. And that is very, very difficult for salmonellas because it has to go through this five days of depending on the temperature before it actually gets to this copepodite stage where it can infect it again. Nopus cannot attach to fish. They're planktonic, so they uh, float around in the water. Uh, they slowly sink unless they jump. They're non-feeding, so they live from the energy that the mother devoted to the egg. So no eating, and this also means that a copper part of that, that doesn't find a fish to start sit, to infest would die of starvation. That's how we define uh, that they actually die. When there's no more energy, there's no more copper part. Remaining five stages of fish. Uh, also, I just wanted to point out that salmon lives are very long lived. My colleague had a tank where he infected some fish and 15 months later he got a bit bored and he actually terminated the experiment but the lice were still alive. So once you have an adult female on your fish, they can go and they keep on producing eggs. So yes, you can have females sitting there month after month and just spewing out eggs. Be aware of that. Yes. So a little bit on larval behavior. So me and especially a lot of my colleagues has run a lot of experiments on this recently. Um, what we see is that not surprisingly, they prefer high salinity and they also uh, like what I call low pressure. So basically, if the larvae doesn't do anything and they prefer to do nothing because they only have limited food with them. They just lie there, they'll sink slowly, and then they jump up. Don't really swim, it's more like a jumping. So if they start to sink too deep, they'll start jumping up. If there is brackish water on the top, then they'll let themselves sink out of it, down into full salinity. Um, so that's general larval behavior, but we see that uh, there's some differences between nopalis and copepodites. So the nopali actually really like cold water. They use less energy in cold water. Uh, and we also see that copepodites tolerate more brackish water. So they probably don't really like the brackish water, but this is an organism that's out to find a host. And uh, since some of the fish don't mind swimming in brackish waters, the copepodites have a behavior that fits that so that it will uh, also be found to some extent up in the brackish layer. Um, so they go to some extent on the brackish water. We also see that, yes, they tend to jump when the pressure when they sink low, but we, so most of the lights are up in the top five meters layer, but they do, we can find them down at 10, 15 meters and even more down. And that's something you should be aware of if you have semi-closed systems or any kind of system where you take in water from uh, below the louse belt, you can still get in lice. So you have to have some extra security to make sure you don't get them into your systems. Uh, and also Calgus elongatus, the other species, are known to have a much deeper distribution. So that is also a problem if you have water intake much lower. Then we also done uh, some studies on infectivity and survival. So I've done a lot of work on temperature and this was sort of the end of it. I don't think we should go into details of these graphs, but basically if we look at temperatures from six degrees and up to 15, we see that the parasite is more and more successful. Uh, my colleague did some other works where the black graph is 5 degrees, red is 10, and the green curve is uh, 15 degrees. And uh, not surprisingly, at uh, 15 degrees, they become infected much earlier, but it's also that the whole area, so the area below the graph sort of illustrates how, how much they can infect. Uh, the sea lice really likes 
15 degrees, it does really well. But then again, it's a parasite of a fish that's also pretty happy at 15 degrees. So, I mean, if you're in doubt what the salmon mouse likes, it mainly likes what this fish likes. Rule of thumb. <laughs> but moving into a little bit bigger picture. So, when a salmon mouse affects a fish, the damage to the fish is highly dependent on the number of lice per gram of fish. That is generally not a big problem for farm fish because they are fairly large. It's something else if you're 18 gram little Atlantic salmon smolt trying to swim out of uh, your fjord and you, need, you don't need to eat a lot of lice to have trouble. Uh, but irregardless of whether you're large or big fish, if you get heavy infections, uh, lice makes wounds, you can get negative effects on fish health, secondary infections, and eventually uh, osmotic problems and death for the fish. But overall, some of the fish are quite tolerant to lice. I mean, if you have a fish that's 500 grams or more, you can put a lot of lice on it and it, it's generally doing quite all right. Uh, so as a fish farmer, you may ask, why do I have to deal so much with this problem? My fish are fine. Uh, it's just that I get this rule thrown upon me that I have to count my fish for <laughs> two weeks and they can't be more than 0.5 lice per fish. But I want to point out that the problem with salmon lice is that they spend a lot of energy on reproduction and they have a lot of offspring. I just uh, tried to do a little fast calculation. We have a site with 0.5 female per fish. So if you pull out 50 fish, you find five adult females and you think, that's good, we, have, we don't have a lot of lice. But the problem is that if you have half a million fish standing in the cages, you're actually producing around 1.5 million nauplus every day that you are exporting out in the fjord or out in the soup. And depending on where the site is, they can hang around in the area or they get transported around and around. This, by the way, is Bergen. And this is where I work. <laughs> yes, connectivity. We have talked about this, and uh, I'm de definitely not uh, expert on connectivity. You can ask Tom Dewey if you have questions on that. But uh, I just wanted to refer to this work that one of my colleagues did, and in, uh, in an area called Production Area Three, which is. Uh, a quite intensively farmed uh, area in Norway, the Hadangerfjord system. Maybe it's also a bit difficult to see my graphs here. Uh, but the point is that, see if I can use this, that you see you have all the sites here and some of them are very connected to others. Some of them have large export and you can also see here, here are all the sites. And you see a lot of sites don't really export many lice, you have them here on the y-axis, how many are exported to other locations. But then over here you see some of the sites actually have a rather large production, it's so large that it goes uh, behind here. Um, so there are some sites that causes a lot more trouble than others. So then uh, what they did was, they did this analysis where they tried to either move problematic sites, uh, which is this uh, relocation, or they tried to close them, so basically reduce them. And then uh, they ran model again and saw um, how it affected this infection pressure, which is just to set to somewhere between 0 and 1. So we have about 150 sites, and if we reduce them, we get less infection between them. But we also see that if you close the sites, the most efficient way to get rid of infection pressure is by having a strategic closure, so you close off the problematic ones. And you see here that if we go from 150 farms to about 125 sites, you can actually, if you close the right ones, you have half the infection uh, pressure between them. So I'm just saying that uh, it is actually quite an efficient tool, and if, it, if you use it, it can actually have very good effects without costing that much. I know there's a lot of aspects to where you put a farm, it's not just this that counts, but it's a tool and it's there and it should be used. 
So, uh, when I come to these slides, I think Espen and I should uh, have talked in advance, so it seems that me and Espen agree on a lot of things. Um, I think at the basis of it is biology, both of the fish and biology of the salmon mouse. Uh, but in this uh, sort of uh, pyramid of things we can do, I think there's this very important middle layer where we have prevention of infection, uh, a lot of things, tools in infrastructure, uh, planning, and choice of production methods. I think Espen has taken us through a lot of these, and I think there's a very big potential to deal with uh, lice. I mean, down here, we can't really change the biology, but we need to know what happens. And here is the Last step in the pyramid, we don't really want to use treatments. Uh, we all know the story of different treatments, you get resistance, and I think the chance of us finding a solution that will last more than a couple of years is quite small. But I think there's a lot of tools on the way that we can use. We don't want to use treatments, they're very costly, they require lots of logistics, that's ever consuming. I mean, what people tell me in Norway that everything in the farm is always boils down to lice management because it's so uh, demanding. You can have environmental impacts of, of, of these treatments. Some of them are very toxic to the environment. Not very smart. We don't become very popular uh, if you use that. And of course, there's the welfare and mortality of both the fish and also the food and the fish that we've heard about. So, really trying to avoid this by using the bottom layers here. So, who are these people who can do something about it? I think the industry has a big role here. There has to be awareness in the industry. And I think it's very important there's awareness of sea life problems on all levels. So, both at the farm sites where you actually see the fish every day, and also in the exclusive offices where decisions are made, people have to be aware that sea lice are important and you have to deal with them, you can just forget about them. Uh, regulatory authorities, I mean these are the ones that imply rules on you, but it's also the ones that can that lay out the framework, and if there is a good framework, and the regulations make sense, they can be a big help. You can use them to uh, build a much better industry uh, and also they of course have a role if your neighbours are not behaving and are not doing something about the problem then they can actually force them to do something about it. Then we have to have contributions from researchers on this biology stuff. Uh, I also put fishermen's NGOs. I mean, these people might be seen as some slightly annoying people, but they also have an input. Uh, he is also the consumer is also over here. There needs to be a communication between all four. And I think being here in Iceland, I think it's a little bit like probably in the Faroes and Norway. Uh, it's quite a small community. People know each other. Also across industry, regulatory authorities, researchers. So it's not that difficult to talk to each other. People need to talk. Then, uh, yes, I had this uh, Norwegian word that I couldn't really uh, translate to English, so I found her, I don't know if this is the right word in uh, Icelandic, but uh, everybody has to contribute because your lies are my lies and my lies are your lies. Uh, it all goes into the fjord or the coastal areas and it's one big soup and we all have to contribute if we are to manage this. And then finally, I think long-term planning is important. Uh, I think if we end up with a solution that's governed by the want for short-term economic growth and cash, we're not going to come up uh, with the best solutions and we'll probably regret it afterwards. And with that, I'll just acknowledge uh, funding, marine research, 
Institute of Marine Research, the Research Council, and this uh, fund we have now, that's called the Norwegian Seafood Research, that has contributed to the research. I listed some of my colleagues, there's of course many more that has contributed. And then I want to say that I'm working on a project with Calga Silangatus, and we really need samples, and we would also like some samples from Iceland, so if you have 50 to 100 lasts, Put them in the national and note down the date and location and send them to me. I'll be very grateful. <laughs> Here is my email. You can contact me, both if you have some advice for me, but also if, if there are general questions about sea life biology, just write them to me and I'll answer if I know the answer and tell you if I don't. <laughs> Thank you. Are there any questions for Susi? Good. Thank you. It sounds very interesting talk, and I really appreciate it. I can see that these slides they have a, a very high reproductive uh, potential, as you mentioned. And uh, by putting these things together with our good colleagues from the Barrow the simulation model, uh, where we, we can build up a huge uh, concentration of nauplias and copepodids and so on. So I was wondering about how can we control it? Uh, out there uh, with some kind of biological control and I was actually uh, reading some interesting studies on using uh, blue mussels filtrating the water and I'm also thinking about uh, clupids uh, filtrating the water for copepodids and so on so I was wondering do you think that it's possible to uh, first of all to control the concentration of these infective stages by some biological control method? With intensive muscle farming and uh, make, making some clupids around uh, filtrating the water, and should that also be built into the models we are actually working on? Because is that a viable idea or is this rubbish? Um, blue mussels will definitely uh, consume, if you put them in a bucket with sea lice, uh, we find them in the blue mussels. Um, and I think there has been various initiatives where, where we have sort of a farm multi-trophic, uh, what's it called, multi-trophic something, where you have fish and then you have blue mussels surrounding it. Uh, I think as a lot of other sea life solutions, it's not a miracle, but in some sites it will be useful. Definitely, yeah. Okay, any more questions? Thank you, Susie.